The darkest of night. Saturday evening. Their Savior had been crucified and buried in a stone-covered tomb. The morning dawned, things began to get lighter, and they had to wonder, what would this new day bring? Good morning, church! Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. You saw the pictures of the empty church and the empty cross, but really, the most important thing that's empty this morning is the tomb. And that tomb is empty, my friends, because we know as a matter of fact and faith and even personal experience that Jesus Christ did not stay in the tomb, that he rose exactly as he said he would. Now, that can be a weird thing for us to think about, the idea that somebody would literally die and rise from the dead. It's even harder to get our heads around that sometimes than the idea that Jesus was holy God and holy man. He was both 100% deity and 100% human, and, and that's why he was able to accomplish what he did on that empty cross that we can look at now. But the cross wasn't empty on Good Friday. It wasn't empty when the nails were driven into his palms and his feet. It wasn't empty when the crown of thorns was driven into his head and the blood dripped down, that blood that saves you and saves me. And so church, again, I say, Christ has risen. And I hope you all just respond that he has risen indeed. This morning, I wanna look at a story that's really popular at Easter, obviously, because it's one of the resurrection stories. But in it, we find a weird twist. We find that disciples are involved and Mary's involved. But Mary has a very different experience with Jesus than you and I. She gets to see him in a way that we never have. And more importantly, she gets a validation from Jesus that he cares about her and knows her deeply. I want us to read the story together. But first, I want to ask you, do you think you could ever mistakenly see somebody as not who they really are simply because of the way they are dressed? What if... What if somebody appeared to you in, in a fireman's outfit and they were your lifelong friend? Would you know who they were? Probably. And, and does it even really matter what we dress like or how we wear our clothes? I mean, I don't know. Is that even important? I mean, what if I wasn't standing here dressed like this on Easter Sunday? What if instead I was dressed like this? Is this what a pastor is supposed to look like? Oh, Okay. Too liturgical, too old-fashioned? Hang on. Is this better? A little less formal. No? How about now? This makes some people happy. This looks like a pastor to some, but to some it looks like an American businessman. So maybe that's not the right answer either. So how about this? Or maybe this is even too dressy for some of you. How about now? How about now? Is this too casual? Yeah, probably. Let's go back. Yeah, I agree. Some of that can be foolish. And this is the way I'm going to do the rest of this message. But I want you to think about that. If you saw somebody as a certain kind of person, is, is their clothing and is the way they look more important or is who they really are more important? More important than that even is, is their connection to you. Let's look at this story. It's not just a story. I say story and some people get upset. Some people say, oh, it's not a story. Well, stories really happen. And this story really did happen. And friends, we read it in the Gospel of John. Chapter 20, starting in verse 1. And I just want you to listen to this. Don't worry about taking notes for this text. But just let the words wash over you. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. That's right, that big stone that had guarded the tomb was gone. It was away from the entrance. And she has a normal reaction. Verse 2, we read, So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running 
But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Here's where the story gets great, friends. Verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. You see, she had a, a connection to Jesus that was more than just head, more than just life experience. It was in her heart. And she wept because Jesus was no longer with them. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. That's the Gospel of John, verse 1 through 18. And it's so amazing, isn't it? We can't even imagine waking up that first morning after the crucifixion, that Saturday where you just sat and wondered what happened. Everything I believed in, everything I thought was going to happen didn't. The worst that could happen did. And, and now this person who I've been waiting for and watching for and following has been crucified and died and buried. And they can't do anything because it's Sabbath and they're still good Jewish people. And so they wait it out. Do you do that? When things look dark, do you sit and try to follow the last instructions you've heard from God? Do you wait it out? Do you wait for the next morning so that you can do what you're supposed to? Because that's what they did. The next morning, Mary gets up and goes to the tomb and she sees that it's empty. She comes back and she tells Peter, and, and if you don't know, most, most people believe that when the Gospel of John talks about the one Jesus loved, he's talking about himself. So Peter and John run to the tomb, and as John points out, he runs further, faster. He gets there first, but he's afraid to go in. So Peter, the impetuous one, goes in, sees that it's empty. John eventually looks in, he sees and believes, but it doesn't say that they believed yet in the resurrection. They believed that the tomb was empty. And friends, that's not enough. And if you think that sounds harsh this morning, then please forgive me. But on this glorious Resurrection Sunday, on this Easter Sunday, above all others, we need to say it's not enough to just stop at believing that he died. It's not enough to just believe that somehow the tomb got emptied. You and I need to believe that he did indeed rise from the dead. Well, the disciples went back. But Mary stands outside weeping. And that's what it's like when you've been broken, friends. When everything that you thought you could depend on has been taken away, when everything that you thought you needed is no more, that's when you find out what's most important. And Mary stands outside of that empty tomb weeping. Now, I know this puts a timestamp on this sermon, but this COVID-19 quarantine Stay at home, shelter at home, social distancing stuff has taken away more than we ever knew we could lose. I'm not a big sports guy. Don't, don't get mad, but I'm not. I like college hockey. 
college hockey, and then if that's not on, I'd like to watch college hockey. I don't get into some of the other sports. I like the Twins and the Vikings and all that, but they took away sports and it didn't change my life. They, they said you can't go to certain places and it didn't ruin my life. The hardest thing for me is not getting to see you all in person and connect with you and, and, and get hugs and hands on the shoulder and how are you doing? That's missing right now so badly. And I'll tell you right now, I'm standing outside of the tomb weeping with Mary. I need a resurrection in my life, friends. I need to know that something bigger and better than I ever believed is going to happen. And God follows through on that. Because Mary's standing there weeping, and she looks and she sees the angels that are sitting at his tomb, one at his head, one at his feet. Now, that enough would be just mind-boggling. And she turns around and she sees Jesus. And this cracks me up. She thinks he's the gardener. I don't know what gardeners looked like back then. And I, they, now they look like anybody else. But she doesn't recognize him. And even hearing his voice, she doesn't recognize him. When he says to her, woman, she doesn't recognize him. Friends, when we get categorized even accurately, when we get put into certain classes and groups and social stratuses, that doesn't say that you know us. That says that you can tell we are or aren't one or the other. But listen to what he does. He calls her name. He says, Mary. And immediately she recognizes him. And she says, Rabboni, which means rabbi or teacher. She knew who Jesus was when Jesus showed her that he knew her name. When he said that, Mary, it was so much more than just an identification as a group or a person. or It was saying, I know who you are. And friends, you may be waiting, I don't know how long you've been waiting to cross that line of faith to say, I believe, but you may have been waiting to know to wonder, does God know my name? Does God know who I really am? I've had people say to me, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. If I were to walk into the, your church, the ceiling and walls would collapse, lightning would strike, and you know what? A lot of those people have come to church, and we're still here, and they're still here, because it doesn't happen. When, when God finally gets connected to you, you don't go, wow, I guess I, I, I got away with it. You realize that God knows you, and you've gotten away with nothing, and he loves you anyways. He knows your name. He comes to you at your worst and his best and calls out your name. That's amazing. And that's what we need. We, we, we love the empty cross and the empty tomb, but it wouldn't matter if we didn't have a risen Savior. He rose and he looked at Mary and he called her by name and she knew who he was. And then she went and told others. So friends, I'm going to put you guys into two categories this morning. There are those of you who have never trusted Jesus for your salvation. And I want to give you that opportunity right now. I want you to know that the God who knows your name is waiting for you to come to him. He is waiting for you to turn so he can say your name and so you could recognize him for who he is. The risen Lord Jesus Christ. If, if that's you, I want to pray with you really fast. And, and, if, and if you, the rest of you would just kind of hold on and wait it out, trust me. Jesus, I thank you that you know my name and, and each and every name of every single person watching this at home. Lord God, I pray that you would meet us right where we are. Lord, help us to turn to you and help us to hear our name proclaimed so that we too will be saved. Help us to trust that your death and your resurrection paid it all. We thank you, God, for that miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, now to the rest of you, to those faithful Christ followers, to those seasoned saints, to those people who have been following God for so long, I want you to do what Mary did. I want you to go into town and tell your story. Because if the resurrection ends with you, it ends. God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children. And so if you've decided, well, I believe, but I'm going to keep it to myself, I have to say you're wrong. You need to go and you need to speak and you need to tell your friends that the one who they seek, the one who they need, has indeed risen from the dead 
And he's waiting to know their name and speak to them too. So regardless of where you're at this morning, whether you're a first-time follower of Jesus Christ, and God, I pray that that would be a huge number of people. The people who are far from you would come close to you and feel your love and care for them. Or whether you're somebody that's already been at the center of that story and you're ready to go tell your story. For all of you, I want you to know this. God knows your name. 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 And friends, that makes all the difference, not just in this world, but for eternity. Knowing that God knows your name, I pray that you would receive a blessing this morning. May the risen Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you. Have a blessed, holy, wonderful, spectacular, death-defying Easter Sunday. Go in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, who knows your name.